Okay, if uh, everyone will make their way to their seats, we're going to start Sunday school. There are some handouts on the chair with an outline of the chapter, so if you don't have one of those, please pick up a copy of that outline. And then but let's, let's open in prayer before we start. Father God, we just give you thanks for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we pray that you would just give us a deeper understanding of who you are, uh, of your sovereignty, and how you use our suffering in your sovereignty. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So today we are... Um, Still in the Surprise by Suffering book by Sproul. Uh, we're doing chapter four today. Chapter four is purpose and suffering. So I think it's safe to say this book is probably not being taught at Joel Osteen's church this morning. Um, and then I hope that you don't make the mistake I did. Uh, we ordered a couple of copies of the book and ended up getting the original version. So if you have this version here, it's missing today's chapter. Uh, so they revised it and inserted a new chapter four uh, that is the purpose and suffering. And so this is what the new book looks like if you don't have it. So this is what we'll be <clears throat> teaching from this morning. So, uh, Denise was, made a comment to me this morning as we were talking about this, that it's, it's interesting that Sproul revised this and inserted this chapter on, on sovereignty of God, because I think it does so much to address suffering and, and how that plays into God's sovereignty and people questioning why these things happen to us. Uh, so those are some of the things we're going to look at this morning. So in chapter 4, um, Sproul starts this chapter really by focusing on God's sovereignty. And we see that there's a theme that runs throughout the Old Testament, as well as Ecclesiastes, where we're going to look at some specific verses this morning. And, and that theme is that God is sovereign. God is sovereign and he has ordained everything according to his purposes. Um, for me personally, that's something that I have really come to uh, appreciate and embrace in Reformed theology. Uh, I did not grow up in a Reformed church and, and we heard about the sovereignty of God, uh, but nothing like you hear it uh, taught and preached in reform circles. So to me, the sovereignty of God is just so comforting. Um, it's so assuring of so many things that we deal with just to know that God is in control of everything. And, you know, it's been mentioned um, in the past few Sundays as Adam and, and Paul were teaching, talking about the maverick molecules. Bud likes to talk about that. There are, there are no maverick molecules. Uh, everything is under God's control. So I went and looked at a, a couple of statements about God's sovereignty. Uh, the first one I want to read to you is from chapter 21 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, and it states, The light of nature showeth that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and doeth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might. So that is such a powerful statement. Uh, I think it, they did a, a great job of just summarizing who God is and, and what his sovereignty means. Uh, it talks about him having lordship over all. 
over everything, that he is good, that he does good to all. So not just to believers, but to uh, the unrepentant pagan. He still does so many good things to them as part of uh, being sovereign. And so what is our response to God being sovereign? Our reaction should be that we should fear God, love God, praise him, and serve him with all of our heart. So uh, as we go through this, you, you'll see how that all ties into what Sproul is trying to teach here. Uh, so then I looked at a couple of verses from scripture that talk about the sovereignty of God. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So where that talks about working together for good, what does that mean? Uh, I think that is saying that, that that's not our earthly comfort. That's not what is, uh, Paul is talking about as he wrote this verse. When he's talking about good, he's talking about our conforming to Christ, which ultimately leads to our justification and sanctification and, and glorification at the end of our lives. So um, everything that God is doing is for our good, even the suffering, the sad times, the, the hard things that we endure, those are meant for our good. Um, one other passage that I looked at was Colossians 1, 16 through 17. And this says, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, again, we just hear how everything is about God's sovereignty and all of these great things that he does for us. Um, on page 38 in the book, um, we start, Sproul starts to address suffering because if things are going well for us, it's easy to embrace or accept that God is sovereign. That's an easy thing to say. Wow, I had a good day today. Everything went well. Thank you, God. You're sovereign. You know, it's because of you that I had this good day. But what do we do when, when we don't have these good days? When we suffer, when things don't go right? Um, can we still say that God is sovereign? So I think we really have to take the good and the bad and say, even, you know, something terrible happened. I lost a loved one. Things didn't go right at work. Um, everybody in our family's arguing. Whatever's going wrong that day, we, we still know that God is sovereign in the good and the bad. So that leads to several questions that Sproul lists here in the book. So those questions are, how could a God who is sovereign and good have allowed these bad things to happen? That seems to indicate that God is not in control, uh, at least from, from how we think about it. Another question, didn't he have the power to prevent these things? Didn't he love me enough to spare me from this pain? Uh, I think we see in a lot of other churches today that uh, the theology is to ab absolve God from any responsibility for the tragedies in human life. Um, we look at all these questions that Sproul raises and we think, you know, surely God could have prevented that from happening. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm trying to serve God faithfully. Why is he letting these bad things happen to me? Uh, so those are some of the things we're going to address in the book and, <clears throat> and talk about some of these questions that he raised. Um, before we move on to the next section in the chapter, does anyone have any comments or questions about 
God's sovereignty. Okay, I guess everybody uh, agrees there that, that God is sovereign in both the good and the bad. All right, the next um, section in the chapter deals with the wisdom of Solomon and uh, focuses on Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. So I'm going to read the first four verses from chapter 7. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of faith, face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So here Solomon starts off by making a comparison uh, to a good name versus a precious ointment. So this probably had a lot more meaning to people generations ahead of us. You know, for us, we can uh, easily run to any of the myriad of Walgreens or CVS pharmacies that are virtually on every street corner and get any kind of remedy or ointment uh, for any type of pain that we're dealing with. You know, we just, we don't understand what, what those precious ointments meant to people in Solomon's time. Uh, those were, you know, there was a lot more suffering, a lot more pain. Uh, you couldn't just pop a Tylenol when you had a headache. Um, so for them, that really meant something, and he's contrasting there your reputation or your good name, how that's so much more important than uh, any precious ointment. And then from there, he moves on to talking about the day of death being better than the day of birth. And so Sproul, uh, when he's talking about this, you know, he's approaching it from both a pessimistic and an optimistic viewpoint of birth and death. And so as Christians, uh, hopefully we are all optimistic about our day of death. We're looking forward to leaving behind the suffering of this world. We're looking forward to being in heaven with our Savior, uh, seeing God face to face. Uh, but for the pessimist, he's probably thinking, well, thank God this is over. You know, I don't have to deal with all these bad things in life anymore. I can move on, there's nothing beyond this, so you know, this life is over. Um, so I think that's kind of what Sproul focuses on here, but I was reading from the ESV study Bible uh, and how it describes these verses and they, it, it takes a different approach than Sproul addresses here. So I wanted to spend some time talking about that. And so where he is talking about the day of death, you know, the ESV study Bible says this is not referring to our day of death, but this is referring to the death of others in our lives. So think about when, when you lose loved ones, you lose friends, uh, you lose people you care about. You know, that is a, a sad time in our lives versus the comparison here for the day of birth. That's an exciting time. We have baby showers, we celebrate uh, children being born. Uh, it's, a, it's a super exciting time in your life as a parent uh, or a grandparent, or even if it's just friends of yours having children. Um, that's, that's an exciting time, but it's short. It, it uh, passes and you move on. But think about the times in your life when you've lost people close to you and how you grieve, um, how you mourn for those people, uh, for their families who 
you know, are, are going through suffering. Um, so that, that can be a time of great spiritual growth for us because we are, we're sad. Um, you know, our option is to look to God for comfort there. Uh, we see so many things in Scripture where God comforts us in those times. Um, so those should be times that we use to grow uh, in our spiritual journey. Yeah, I, I was thinking back, uh, so my, all of my grandparents were born just over 100 years ago. Um, each of my grandparents had a sibling who died as an infant. If that was commonplace from the beginning of time until really a hundred years ago. Uh, you know, just the last few generations, we don't experience that like uh, people did just a hundred years ago. So you know, those, those generations dealt with a lot of suffering that we don't deal with. We really have it pretty easy today relative to the history of mankind with medical advances, um, you know, you can, you can be diagnosed with a disease today that you can be cured or healed or treated and still have uh, a high quality of life. But a hundred years ago, that was a death sentence. You know, there was nothing you could do but just die and suffer. So we really are blessed uh, in the time we live in, just in the fact that we don't know suffering uh, like people throughout time have known. And so there, there have been a few times in my life where I have thought, I just have it too good. Um, you know, why am I not suffering? Should, should I be suffering for something? Uh, whether it's physically or spiritually or emotionally, you know, whatever the case is. Uh, so any of you ever felt like that um, or want to share some situations maybe where you've gone through something? Maybe that's something a little too personal that you don't want to share, but um, I don't know. I don't think on, think on that as much as I did years ago, but I, I had often wondered why I'm so blessed and have it so good. And, you know, because we see so many of God's people throughout Scripture who suffered greatly. Uh, and we're so fortunate that, that we don't have to suffer uh, in God's sovereignty and His goodness. So uh, before we move to the next section of the chapter, uh, do any of you have any comments or, or questions about Solomon's wisdom and, and what he says about birth and death or how we suffer in those situations? Mike? Yes, you should. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, Jeff, uh, look at you know, verse 13. Uh, there's a, a quite a strong statement of God's uh, sovereignty, and I wonder if you just might kind of speak to that for a moment. Yeah, and, and that's something I'm about to get to. That's coming up. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll cover that in just a minute here. Uh, the next section of this chapter is called The Houses of Mirth and Mourning. So this is starting on page 40. Um, so the house of mirth refers to expressing joy or merriment and is associated with an act. Uh, it's a synonym for cheer cheerfulness, which is a habit of mind. So myrrh is more of something short term that you can do to be entertained or to feel good uh, versus just having a general cheerful attitude all the time. Um, so he, Sproul equates uh, 
mirth here to going to a party. Something where you can just, you can put aside all the cares of the world. Um, you know, for, for me, I was thinking uh, this time of year, I, I work a lot. I'm really busy with tax season. I have a lot of deadlines and a lot of things on my mind. I wake up early every morning. My mind starts racing, thinking about the things I have to do, the deadlines I have to meet. Um, but my sons are playing basketball. And so I, I look forward to those basketball games, which you know seem to be every night of the week, uh, four or five times a week. But that's something I really look forward to because I forget about all the cares of the world. And I just um, enjoy being there, watching them, and you know, watching them succeed and have fun. And it just takes my mind off of all the concerns of the day and the things that you know might be weighing me down. So um, Sproul talks about the houses of myrrh and mourning. So we said mirth is a short-term thing; it's an action. The house of mourning leads us to a place where we can go and gain wisdom. So this, I think this compares back to what we were just talking about a minute ago with birth and death, how that's a time of excitement versus a time of sadness or mourning. And so uh, when we talk about going to the house of mourning, uh, we think about Jesus and how he was often in the house of mourning. Uh, I want to read a passage from Isaiah 53, 3. It says, you know, this is prophecy about the coming Messiah. It says that he will be despised and rejected by men, <clears throat> a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So, Jesus really knew what it was like to be in the house of mourning. Uh, I don't know if it, are any of you watching the Chosen series? Anybody? We've been we've been watching it, and we're just into season three. Um, I really love how they portray Jesus and his disciples in the show because they they make him seem so real, like a you know, just like a normal person, although he's obviously different than just your normal everyday person. He's the son of God. Um, but as, as I've watched those things, I just thought, you know, they seem to make Jesus a little too cheerful in this show. He's, he's always kind of cracking jokes and laughing with the disciples. And you know, maybe he was like that. I don't know. But I just uh, have always pictured Jesus as being so much more serious and somber. Uh, and when we read these verses like this who, that talk about uh, Jesus and his sorrows, uh, I think of him being more like that. So I don't know how y'all feel about that, if that's something you ever think about. But um, there's, there's so many passages of Scripture that talk about Jesus' suffering. Um, you know, probably just having to, to be a man was, was some point of suffering for him, not being uh, in heaven with God. So Isaiah also goes on to say that unlike the kings of the world, the servant of the Lord conquers by suffering. So that's so contrary to what we think as a, as a leader, as a ruler. You know, that's why the, the Jews, uh, one of the reasons the Jews despised Jesus, even his own disciples thought that he was going to be a conquering king, uh, not that he was going to be a suffering servant. Uh, but we see that was really his purpose in coming was being a suffering servant. Uh, so S Sproul goes on to say, for by a sad countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise 
is in the house of mourning. The heart of fools is in the house of mirth. And then we get to verse 13 that Mike was asking about. And Solomon really changes his perspective here. So now he's telling us to consider the work of God. So this is not just simply observing what's what God is doing, but to think about it deeply, to contemplate on it, to meditate on it, uh, to consider it, to evaluate it, to dwell on it, so that we can figure out what it means and how we can better understand it. And then in the next verse, uh, Solomon goes on to say, who can make straight what he has made crooked? Uh, So again, we're reminded of God's sovereignty. And in the book, Sproul has a great reference for those of you who are golfers. Uh, He taught... He talks about playing golf with his friends and how some of his friends uh, could not hit a straight shot and would ask for his help, for his prayer, so that um, he could, they could straighten out their golf shots. And Sproul said he always comes back with this verse and says, you know, no one can straighten what God has crooked. So, <laughs> uh, and he, he, he certainly says, you know, that is a lighthearted approach to this verse. He's not trying to be um, cavalier about the meaning of that verse, but he just loves to use that as an example uh, in everyday life that some of us who are golfers can relate to. Uh, So before we move on to the next section, uh, any comments or questions about the houses of mirth or mourning? Yeah, the mic. <clears throat> well, Ecclesiastes as a book is definitely challenging to to understand because um, there's a lot of um, you know the, the wisdom of man is the, is the folly of God, right, and vice versa. So, so here, you know, we're looking at despair that can occur if you if you naturalistic man is all about you know finding. You know, perfection in this world, and, and the idea is, well, you know, the sin has corrupted it, and so only God, through uh, the power of, of the Son, can can really bring true joy. And so, in some ways, you look at this and it's kind of counterintuitive, like we've been talking about. You know, really, you're going to be mourning, and that's going to bring you wisdom. But, um, but truly, I think you know, the idea here is we cannot obviously save ourselves, and we are so. This world tells us we can, and so in the end, you know, it truly is the mourning, the the recognition. And, and like Paul does in all the all his epistles, you know, you re, he's reaching for God because he realizes just how much is lost here, right? But with his purpose and and recognizing that God has used that suffering to to bring us closer to Him. So in a sense, you know, you could take this to extreme and say, you know, he's you know, what is, what is he talking about here? You know, to, to to be wallowing in mourning? No, no, we're to seek the wisdom that comes from the folly of man, meaning we cannot save ourselves. So that's the way I look at. It. Um, yeah, there, there are so many similarities in Ecclesiastes to Proverbs where he talks about uh, folly and wisdom and uh, just going back to Christ being a suffering servant. You know, that didn't make sense to people uh, that he was around, his disciples, that he had to suffer to accomplish what he came to accomplish. Uh, in man's eyes, that sounds, well, you know, why wouldn't you just destroy all the Romans and just make everything good? Um, I, uh, as I was reading this, I kept thinking about the, the hymn that we sing often, Man of Sorrows. Uh, here in our worship services, you know, we sing that song a lot, and it, it has some, some deep, rich meanings that talk about how Christ was a man of sorrows. Uh, so thank you, Ryan. Uh, the next section in this chapter talks about the providence of God, and this is on page 42. And so here it says, The call to consider the work of God is not just creation, but how God has worked throughout history, reflecting on how He is the author of all things mirthful and mournful. <clears throat> 
God is the creator of both the good and sad times in our lives. If he is sovereign, we have to take the good with the bad. So now we see how these things are, are tying into God's providence. We've talked about him being sovereign. And in the providence of God, he uses the good times and the bad times to mold us, to conform us to Christ. And, and if we believe that God is sovereign, we have to accept those bad times as well as the good times and not just expect good times all the time and everything to go the way we want it. Um, so Sproul talks about God being the source of all goodness. And this was something that even ancient philosophers believed. So Aristotle defined ethics as having a standard for goodness. So, you know, we, we think as believers that God is that standard. We talk about good and evil and the contrast. People say, well, why is there evil in the world? I've always thought, well, you know, without evil, you don't really see how good God is because he's, he, he is the only one who is good. Uh, Cicero introduced something called uh, a Latin phrase, sumum bonum, which meant the highest good. And Plato called God the idea of the good. So I don't think Plato had any idea who uh, the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah, was, but uh, he still said that God is the idea of good. So he's setting a standard there that we would all agree with for God. And so along with that, there, I think we would say that there is a law of goodness that God must obey. And that is just his character. So his, his character is good. So he, he cannot do anything outside of his character other than be good. Um, he always acts according to his nature and his character because he's holy and righteous. So we've seen some, some people talk about God's goodness here, but many have disputed God's goodness and said things contrary to God being the standard of being good. There was a British philosopher named John Stuart Mill. He was a classical liberal, and he looked at the world being filled with pain, suffering, and evil, and said, if God is all-powerful and allows evil, then he cannot possibly be good. So he's trying to set a very different standard for who God is and, and what goodness means. Uh, so Sproul goes on to talk about some meaningless events or senseless tragedies. Um, to us as Christians, we would say there are no meaningless events or senseless tragedies. They are all part of God's purpose and part of his plan, and he's using those for his good. Um, it, it, I looked at a, a video that Sproul did teaching on this subject. It was not specifically from this chapter of the book and, and tying to this book, but it had a lot of similarities. And he talked about living in the proximate, uh, which means here, you know, we live on earth, bad things happen to us every day. There is sin, there's pain, there's suffering. Evil is not an illusion. Uh, we see evil every day in our lives. Maybe it's not happening to us. Uh, but we see it in the news. You know, we just uh, just had an event uh, recently in Memphis where, you know, sadly someone was killed by police. And usually those things happen. I'm giving the police the benefit of the doubt and thinking, you know, they're they're trying to do the right thing. We see this this situation though. It was just they they did everything that they were not supposed to do. They violated all their protocols, uh, all their policies. Uh, so even though they had a standard for things that they were supposed to do in dealing with someone, uh, 
You know, you can't control the evil in people's hearts. Um, we see especially politicians today who want to create uh, nirvana by if we can just pass enough laws, you know, we can, we can stop these evil things from happening. But th that's not going to work, right? Um, you know, God already has laws in place that, that man doesn't follow. We break every one of his laws. And so um, this evil is in our lives. We see it every day. It's real. We know that in the world there's going to be tribulation. But we, look, we looked at this verse um, earlier when we were starting, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God uses bad things uh, happening to us for our good. So I think we could say that even uh, all of these tragedies or senseless, meaningless events that we're talking about, for us as Christians, those are ultimately a blessing uh, because God is using those somehow in our life to do something for us. Uh, pagans are obviously going to have to, they're going to have a different perspective on this. They're not going to respond in gratitude or repentance for God's gifts. Uh, and ultimately, that's affecting their judgment. It's affecting how they're going to be judged. Uh, they're taking the good, but they're not taking the bad and realizing this is something from God that's good for me, even though... I, they may see it as being bad. Um, so we would also say that if there's no justice, then God is not good. Because in addition to being good, he's just. And so he's going to require justice to fulfill his uh, attribute of being good. And Sproul goes on to say that God is not responsible for giving nothing but blessings to rebellious humans. So, uh, like we were just talking about with the pagans, um, you know, God blesses them uh, even though they are uh, unrepentant and ungrateful. You know, he still has blessings for them as well. Um, not, it's not in this book, but... Um, I listened to Sproul talking about uh, a popular book that you've probably heard of that was written a few decades ago. It's written by a Jewish rabbi, Kushner, and it was called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. So I'm sure several of you have heard of that book. And Sproul said, man, I would have loved for my publisher to have come to me and said, I want you to write this book. He said, it would have been the easiest book I've ever written. He said, I would have called it uh, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. It would have one page and it would say, they don't. <laughs> so I, th I thought that was funny. And he was just uh, talking about how there is none who is righteous. No, not one, just God. Uh, you know, we think about the rich young ruler coming to Jesus and calling him good teacher. And how did Jesus respond to him? He said, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. Um, okay, before we move to the last section, any comments or questions on the providence of God? Brian. One general comment, um, the whole topic of the Sunday School is suffering. And we can't cheat that emotional experience by trying to intellectualize it. And by that I mean rationalize the good that is in suffering. Now I believe in a sovereign God, but you know, our suffering comes first person and it also displays our Christianity and how we comfort others and their suffering. Yeah. So. I can't rationalize this, much like Job's friends who came to him and gave him theology. When they were first there, just by him, that was the most comforting thing they could do. 
And that's the lesson that we take from Job. But here, I mean, for my case, it's hard to look at some of the things that have happened and see and rationalize that they're good. I know they are ultimately in God's sovereignty, mm -hmm. but in the moment, it's really difficult to do that. So it's just one caution, at least in our Sunday school class. Don't, don't take away the emotion of suffering. It is there. Yeah. And, and we see sometimes um, fellow believers who just seem to have so much heaped on them and dumped on them and, and they're experiencing a totally different level of suffering than any of us do. And you almost want to say, well, why, why them? Why do they have it so bad and, and I have it so good? Sure. I appreciate that. I really appreciate what Brand said, and that, that gives us an opportunity to, to make a really important qualification. Um, what the, the, the bad things that happen are bad. We're not saying they're transformed into good. Evil is evil, bad is bad, death is bad, etc. Uh, what's good is that our God is working good in us through those horrible things. Mm -hmm. So the mystery uh, and, and the pain and the suffering are still there. We're not saying that it doesn't hurt. It does. Right. And it's, it's, you know, as a pastor, and, you know, when we see particularly, um, you know, a family continue to go through repeated instances of suffering, that's an inexplicable thing. I mean, it's emotionally mm -hmm. very hard to deal with. So we're not trying to say those things in themselves are good. Right. Yeah, and I, I think that's important, and I think what Brian was driving at is that we're not transforming evil into good. No, evil is evil, but you think about the, the prototype suffering, and Sproul talks about this, and others who've defended this point, the ultimate evil was the cross, and that was, that's not good. It was yes. not good to crucify the Son of God and lie and all that, but what came out of it was good the salvation of the world. So that's the perspective we share. So we, we suffer, we cry, we groan, we hurt. And I think what Brand said is really important that that's where just the ministry of, uh, of being there with them and not trying to put a theological spin on it that we're not capable of doing at the moment. Yeah. You know, and, and Job's friends had bad theology, by the way. Right. They actually have bad theology. So it's important to do what Brand is suggesting is just, you know, I don't have to give answers, you know. I need to be there holding in their hand and praying yep. for them and things like that. So I really appreciate that comment. Well, and you know, we just have a couple minutes left here. So wrapping this up, we, we looked at the beginning at some of these questions. Why do these things happen to good people? Why does God allow these things? Why does he not prevent them or stop them? Sproul ultimately says, you know, I don't know. We, we don't know the mind of God, we, we can't determine why he's allowing these things to happen, but it's ultimately for his good because he is sovereign and he has a plan in place. And these are not just random things that, you know, that God was not paying attention today. And oh, this, this really sweet Christian lady got cancer and is going to die because he was uh, off doing something else. It's, it's uh, something that he had ordained and he knows uh, is gonna happen and it somehow is for, for that person's good, even though it, it doesn't seem to be good to us. Um, so just to, to wrap up everything here, um, you know, we've talked about how we have such comfortable lives and uh, you know, we're not tortured, we're not imprisoned yet for uh, being Christians in this country. We still have a lot of freedoms and, and a lot of good things that happen to us. Um, yet, like you were saying, Mike, we are human and we experience pain. So these are, these are things that are painful. Uh, they're, they're tough, but they can be used ultimately for our good. So reading this chapter, I kept thinking, you know, this just seems like a study on God's sovereignty. This doesn't seem like a study on suffering. Um, I feel like I'm just being told, here's God, he's sovereign, and here's who he is. 
and, and the suffering is very minor compared to that. Uh, I think the bottom line here is that God's hand is in affliction. Uh, he's sovereign over the dark sides of life. Uh, but he's going to redeem the world through suffering. Uh, you know, we talked about Christ being a suffering servant. That's how he has redeemed us by suffering. And that was the ultimate evil that the only one who was good suffered and died and took our punishment um, that we deserved. So I think we can say that ultimately our purpose in suffering is not without purpose. We serve a sovereign God and we are carrying out his purposes as a sovereign God when we suffer. And we can have joy even in suffering knowing that we are part of carrying out the purposes of God. So, any other comments or questions that you have about suffering or sovereignty or anything we talked about? But And, and I would certainly concur with everything that, that everyone has said, and, and including what Brand has said. But we get pretty focused on our suffering, okay? And, and, and I think, I've been just laying into this verse in, in Psalm 89 recently where it says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne, okay? It, that's what God is about. And, and we miss, I think, and we haven't talked about it too much, that in our suffering, yeah, it's for our good, but ultimately, ultimately, it is for God's glory, mm -hmm. okay? Because it says that in the end, and we'll get to this maybe in our last lesson in this, in this book, that when this is all over and done, we will see God's glory. It doesn't say anything about we're going to see our glory and, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, everything is going to pass and we're going to be healed and all of that business, but we will behold God's glory. And, and I think that will bring a much clearer understanding <laughs> to suffering yeah. when that occurs for believers, obviously. Yeah, I agree. And I just wanted to add that um, Charles Spurgeon is, the way he puts things and the way he looks at things to me is so, like, gra you can grasp what he's saying. And he, he said, you know, God cuts us like stones of his temple. I mean, he's, he's making us beautiful and, you know, looking at Revelation and where, in heaven and all the gems and beautiful, you know, things that are compared to gems in the earth, it's like that. He's about making us ready to be with him. And, um, and just the suffering is not, he's, he's polishing and cutting us where we need to be cut mm -hmm. and making us understand our hearts are so arrogant toward him and um, thinking we know best, um, not taking away from the pain because it is painful. Yeah. And we know ultimately that we're going to end up in a place where there is no suffering. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? If not, uh, we'll have you know, about a 30 minute time of fellowship um, and our worship service will start at 1030. So enjoy some time for fellowshipping. <laughs>